back with another one. This is episode number 65 of Hebrews in Exile with our honorable teacher, Robert B. Holman Jr. and Sean Appleton. And in the next series of podcasts, we're going to dive into the mitzvot, or in other words, the commandments that have been given to the children of Israel by the Most High through his servant, Moshe. We are going to open these mitzvot up and try to explain all of them that are relevant to us as we are in exile. So sit back and relax, prepare to learn. Hebrews in exile, you know what we do. Let's go! This is Rabbi Robert B. Homer Jr. and Sean Appleton. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> Let's Maybe there'll be somebody else tonight. Then. <laughs> let's, let's, do this. let's do this again. We're having too much fun up here. This is Rabbi Robert B. Homer Jr. and Sean Appleton. And this is Hebrews in Exile. exile. Uh, excuse the double entry. <laughs> I just kind of got ahead of myself. My brain is is is, is working oh, at, a, at a different at a different speed this evening. Mm-hmm. You know, um we over this year and some months that we have been podcasting, we've talked about a lot of things. And I've started into talking about the mitzvot, and we've talked about them and here and there, and then we've gotten off on other subjects. But I want to get back to sharing with Hebrew Israel the mitzvot. Yeah. Very important. And I, I want to say to our to you that the mitzvot are very important to the Hebrews way of life. It's life changing. It is Systemic to our relationship with the Most High, even in this exile. There are many negative things that have been said about the Father's word and his commandments and his mitzvot to his people. I want to be able to set the record straight as we get into them. And I want to say to our listeners that setting aside the mitzvot that are germane to animal sacrifice, I'm not going to talk about those. Okay. Because those mitzvot or commandments are commandments that cannot be done in exile. In exile, right. They'll be reinstated once we're back in the land in the seventh day. And many people want to know, so well, what what are the mitzvot that are applicable to us in this exile? And what are, what are, what what should we be doing? While religion has told you that the commandments and the mitzvot of the Most High are not for you, and that they're old, antiquated done away with and you shouldn't follow them I'm telling you that there is nothing that's antiquated about the most high's word it's as fresh today as it was when he opened his mouth and spoke it secondly the misfotes that we're going to talk about in general are all germane to a moral attitude. They speak to they speak to morality. Outside of the fact that keeping the Sabbath most high is that's our first commandment that he's given to us to do that, keep the Sabbath and honor it and what it consists of. And I think we've talked about that 
in a podcast before. It's yeah. going it's going to come up in our lesson, but it's not going to get there uh, for for. And I'm sure we won't get to it tonight as we start talking about these mitzvot. Now, this is probably one of the it's, it's exciting. The the other the other mitzvot that is is critical to understanding, which we won't get to tonight because it's in the book of Shemot, is the mitzvot that's in Vayikra Leviticus chapter eleven, which deals with the dietary laws. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a whole podcast in itself. Yeah, you know, we'll talk about yeah. those. We'll talk about those downstream, and the third has to do with. Vayikra chapter 23, the Moedines. Festivals, yes. The festivals. So generally speaking, most people know that the mitzvot are germane to keeping the Sabbath mm-hmm. honoring the, the di- and honoring the dietary laws. Those two things are, are critical. Other than that, things outside the parameters of that are systemic to our, our moral, our, our moral actions. And the Most High has said to us that the word, his mitzvot, his commandments are nigh thee. Yeah. Where? In, even, even in your mouth, mouth to be able to do them. And yeah. you'd be surprised. Written on your heart. You'd be surprised at how many of the Father's commandments, mitzvot, <laughs> statutes, regulations, and laws yeah. that you and everybody actually live by while they're telling you that you shouldn't. Right. Yeah, you're doing the majority and, of them already. You know, the problem with that is it shows a lack of understanding, a lack of acumen in relationship to the Father's word mm. when a person tells you that because they're telling you not to do something that is part of our civilized way of living. And I don't care where you live in the world. Right. Right. Right, right. So I, I wanna I wanna start I wanna start tonight with a with an introduction. And uh this introduction basically talks about the way we were able to nurture our bodies and keep it spiritually alive and healthy is by adhering to the commandments, mitzvot exactly as the Torah explains them to be. Mm. Now the thing about the father's mitzvot is that and his teaching is he didn't give us something that you can treat like Burger King. Yeah. Where you can have it your Your way. way. No, you can't, you can't (laughs) have it your way. (laughs) Right. The most high is specific. He's direct. Mm. And what he says, he expects us to carry it out in that, in that form, in that manner. So there are positive commandments that are physically performed within the, our, the organs of our body and give us an opportunity to evaluate ourselves and increase our position in the messianic era. Mm-hmm. There, is a, there, is a, there is a day coming. We happen to be living in the dispensation of grace. Mm-hmm. It's the sixth day. It's the sixth day. There's a seventh day coming. The seventh day that's going to come, what we're teaching these mitzvot, these commandments, these statutes, and these precepts are all going to be alive. Yeah. And well in application in the land, including the animal sacrifices. Yeah, absolutely. They're all going to be in play. Right. But the question that you have to ask yourself is, well, what's critical for me to, to, to understand and to uh to walk in and live in today in right. this exile? Right. The Torah prohibits prohibitions rather are referred to as negative commandments which are meant to prevent us from losing our share or position in the messianic era. Now when I talk about the positive and the negative uh, mitzvahs and commandments, it is that when we adhere to and when we come to a knowledge of understanding their application, 
we have to then abide by and live by and walk by them. Mm. Now, I'm going to go across the street. I got to go across. I just, I got to go across the street gotta, for a minute. Got to move you across the street. Yeah, All right. And I, I got to go to the Hebrew text. And I think it's in Hebrews chapter 10. Okay. It says, once you come to the knowledge of the truth, there therefore remains no, no sacrifice, sacrifice for sin. For sin. Now, the question that we have to ask as we get into the mitzvot is the question is, what is sin? Mm. The mark. Missing the mark. And the issue when we ask what is sin, there are there are a lot of responses that tell us or we have we have heard what sin is, but all of the responses that we have heard about what sin is have been based on policy and not on the legal, the legality of the law or the teachings of the Most High. Mm. Agreed. Agreed. So, what did they tell you sin was when you were coming up in the Baptist church? Wow. That's a great question. Sin. I think they tried to, I don't think they, they, matter of fact, I know they didn't simplify it to say it's missing the mark. Like I had mentioned before, uh, it was trying to pick out individual pieces of text in the new Testament that said, oh, okay, adultery and look at this particular concept. This is a sin. And it was, it was nothing cohesive. It was nothing that was uh, uh, you could go to some, my a friend, friend's church and have the same criteria for sin. It changed everywhere we went because it wasn't really spelled out. So it was more of a, a quandary of what sin was. And it was kind of based on where that, what the text that says, you know, um, uh, Everyone did what was according, what was just right. What was right in his own eyes. What was just right heart. in his own eyes. I think that was the best way yeah, to ex yeah, kind of explain yeah, it, to yeah. say we defined it based on, I think, the bylaws and the structure of the organization that we were in. That's what defines it. See, if you, came up, if you came up in the, in the 70s, no, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, particularly in the apostolic churches, Sin could be you ladies wearing um, <laughs> outfits with no sleeves. Right. Right. That was a sin. Right. Wearing red. Red? Was a sin. Oh, because of the, the what are they associated with? Jezebel? Jezebel. Oh, yeah, okay. Jezebel, Jezebel didn't look nothing like that. Okay. Uh, wearing jewelry, earrings, m makeup, mm. uh, lipstick, all of these things in the apostolic Pentecostal, Pentecostal church okay. uh, was a sin. Now, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. I know that just across the board, the one thing that the ev I think everybody pointed to was the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Say, well, if you violate these then that's kind of the basis or criteria, which, by the way, is just the Ten Utterances. It's not the well, Ten Commandments. Well, Those are found somewhere else. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> if, you, if, if that was their criteria of violating them, <laughs> they violated the very, the very second commandment that the Most High gave, and that was to keep and honor his, his Sabbath. And his Sabbath is not on Sunday. That's right. That's right. So, so yeah. you know, the criteria for sin mm. was a hogpodge of policy yeah. that's been established by the religious body in order to control and yeah. to keep people in check. Um, going to a, going to the movies yeah. was a sin. <laughs> you I, know, I couldn't even, I couldn't even go see Bugs Bunny at the movies. No. You know what it sounds like? It's like, they built their mini Talmud, the yeah, fence yeah, around it. Yeah, 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 we don't want you to do the fall and it is because that will lead you into something else. So just don't do these things that will push you in that direction. Going to a dance 
was a sin. <laughs> oh boy. Listening to, listening to any music that wasn't, that didn't speak about God or Jesus Christ was, was a, a sin. sin. So wow. my sister grew up in the house. She couldn't listen to R and B and she, we used to sneak and listen to R and B, but she couldn't listen. R and B was taboo. That was a sin. Couldn't listen to R and B. Wow. Wow. Um, couldn't go, couldn't go out to any place where, hmm. where liquor was being served. Even though you went to the restaurant to eat, they serve in a lot of places, particularly high end places. All of these things, all of these things were a sin. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me you couldn't go to a restaurant where they serve no. alcohol? No. Wow. No. Wow. You guys were the Pharisees of the no, strict. It was very sect. strict. Very strict. Very, very strict. strict. Very strict. And so the problem mm. with this is that when you understand, and even even today, mm. even today in a lot of religious circles, um, the 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 structure of holding people accountable to sin is not based on the Father's word as much as it is based on policy. Mm. With the with the catalyst, with the catalyst of scriptorial statement being come out from among them and be separate. Wow. And the most and God has called you to be different than the world. Now the next part of this of sin is the idea of doing anything at all that falls into the criteria of worldly. Mm. So now you got to ask yourself, well, what's worldly? Right. Yeah, that's kind of a broad generalization of. I couldn't. <laughs> I coming up. I couldn't. We couldn't go to the. We couldn't go to the. Uh, we couldn't go roller skating at the roller rink. Unless we were going as a youth organization and we were renting it out and we we're going to play Christian music. Otherwise, if you're going to the roller rink, they're playing all this other music. That's worldly. You can't listen to that. You can't do that. Mm. Yeah. Couldn't go bowling. What, did, I mean, what were you allowed to do? I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you, we were allowed oh to goodness. go to, we were allowed to go to church. See, that's, that's, wow. And, 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 you know, that's, that's where, that's where the problem ar arise, arise. But then, you know, the religious circles want to hold you accountable to policy. Mm -hmm. And you don't debate with them because, uh, he he's called me. I'm I'm your overseer to watch for your soul. So we're not. Don't question what. Don't question what I'm what I'm saying to you. Yeah, it's taking a lot of scriptorial text out of context to use it for the benefit of control. So, as we get back to the things that the Father has laid down to help us to understand the narratives of what of what's real compared to what's not real. That's a song, isn't it? Every, yeah. yeah. Every, every seminarian, every seminarian knows this language. When you ask them what is sin, every seminarian will tell you missing the mark. Hmm. Now, the next question is, what's what, the mark? What's the mark? See, because they're, they're not able to define what the mark is. But if I go, if I go back across the street and I listen to Shaul, Shaul says, I press toward the mark of the prize of the calling, which resides in Christ Jesus. Now, I personally, based upon Shaul's testimony 
in Philippians and his testimony in Acts 24 and 14, I don't believe he said that. I don't believe he said that because the mark has been established by the Most High, which happens to be his laws, his rulings, his statutes, and his precepts. When we, when we do that, when we miss those, we have now violated him, which the Most High refers to Hebrew Israel as a reason for why we're in this exile, because we did not follow the mitzvot and the commandments that he gave us. Therefore, we sinned right. against him and his word, and we're out here in this exile, according to Lamentations chapter 5, where seven, our ancestors sinned. And for this reason, we are, I'm paraphrasing, we are serving the results of their actions. Right. Lamentations 5, 17, you can go read. 5 mm -hmm. and 7, you can read it. Earthly existence has two components. One is beneath the sun and the other is above the sun. So in Ecclesiastics 1 and 3, it says, what does a person gain from all of his labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come, generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun sets, then it speeds to its place of rest. For there are people, excuse me, let me stop right there. Let me stop right there, let me go back. So, so the idea here in Ecclesiastes tells us that we labor and we toil for things that are under the sun. And generations come, generations go, and things rise, the sun sets. But the one thing that remains constant, mm. that remains constant for us, is the fact that the Father's word remains constant. It doesn't go away. Nor does it change. Nor does it change. Right. Devarim chapter 7, verse 6 and 9 says, For you, now he speaks to Hebrew Israel, and we need, and we need to understand this. You and I have talked about this somewhat before, but I, I'm just going to lay a kind of, I guess we're going to lay in a foundation for it tonight. He says, for you are a people set apart as holy for Yahweh Eloheka. Yahweh Eloheka has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his own unique treasure. Treasure. Yahweh didn't set his heart on you to choose you because you numbered more than any other people. On the contrary, you were the fewest of all people. So when you look at us, mm. when you look at Hebrew Israel, while it is that we have, we have heard about the seed of Abraham being as many as the stars in the sky and the sand of the sea, that's prophetic. The words of those statements to Father Abraham were prophetic into the future. And they're prophetic into the future because when we look at the seed of Father Abraham and we look at Hebrew Israel and exile, Hebrew, Hebrew Israel and exile has multiplied exponentially by, 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 uh, um, uh, pro by procreating with the nations. So in in the in the language of the uh across the street we have many samaritans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We have exactly. we have many we have many half breeds. Mm. But the point being is that if you have if you have an ounce of Hebrew blood in you then you are connected to the father's family, which takes us to another idea of thought process to say that all Hebrew Israel, not black. black. That's correct. That's correct. That's we correct. may be, we may be, we're melanated, but the melanation has hues. There are hues of this melanation. Sure. sure. Absolutely. So now he tells you that he has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his own unique treasure. And you have to stop and think about that. Mm -hmm. You got to stop and think about, you have to stop and think about how great of a people and a person you are 
because you have been chosen out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be a unique treasure. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this before. If you don't understand how great you are, you'll always be in a state of having your, your, um, what's that word I'm looking for? Um, Mm. you'll always be you'll always be functioning in a state of low esteem okay agree I mean the most high by this statement raises the consciousness he elevates the persona and he makes his people understand how great you are so that your esteem can't be damaged. But the only way that your esteem can be damaged is by the absence of his word. Sure. And his word is within the framework of Torah. Absolutely. Okay. So he's chosen you out of all the peoples and uh, to be his own unique treasure. Now, see, what that again should resonate a lot more for individuals that are trying to matriculate because I'm going to bring another element in here is that a lot of people don't are not associating themselves with Hebrew Israel. And in order to get the full gravitas of that statement, you have to, cause we've been, we've been told all our lives. That's for us. That's for the Jews. Right. Those are the, those, those people, yeah. you don't see yourself being connected to that statement because it's for another people, but it's really talking it's about, talking about you, you, you. Yeah, yeah. Talking about us. Mm -hmm. He goes on to say, rather it was because Yahweh loved you and because he wanted to keep the oath, which he swore to your ancestors. Now, I want to, I want to, I, I want to stop right there. I, I, and we, we, we talked about this in another podcast. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's no other people on the face of the earth. That's a unique treasure to him. There's no other nation of people on the face of the earth. That's a unique treasure to him. It's correct. He's already spoken in his word and defined who the unique treasures and the unique people are. Mm -hmm. And he's also said, that he loves you. What, what greater, what greater love, right, is there that a man can show and give than for the creator who created all things to say to what he's created and chosen them out of all the nations that he's created to be his unique treasure and then tell you how much he loves you. Yeah. And then he goes on to tell us in one of the other, other, other chapters of the prophets, he says, he says, he says, Israel, I loved. Mm. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Mm. So you Hebrew Israelites in exile have to understand that by our following the commandments of the Most High, we fall into a category that's unique, that's special. You know, you know what? I was, I'm trying to find that you know text what? that says wherever you, a man's uh, 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 heart, his treasure is, that's where his heart, where his heart is. is. Yeah. is, is you know well. something? You know something? Yes, sir. Every woman. Uh-oh who is in a relationship with a man wants that man to love her unequivocally and unconditionally. Sure. Sure. Without fail. Without fail. Absolutely. Hebrew Israel, we are the father's wife and he's telling us Opening here in Devarim that you're unique. Mm -hmm. You're a treasure. Mm -hmm. And that I love you. Coming from your man. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, that should, that should lift your spiritual 
consciousness and your spiritual self-esteem, you should have your head held high, knowing beyond a reasonable doubt that it's not a man that told you he loves you. But it's the most high. It's the yeah. most high who created you, who lives and lives and lives mm -hmm. and lives and lives and lives and cannot die. Right. Says to you and the generations before you and the generations after you, you're a unique treasure and I love you. Mm. <sighs> and not only do I love you, but I keep my covenant and extend grace to those who love him and um, watch this down here and observe his mm -hmm. misfits to a thousand generations. How many generations is a thousand generations? Uh, uh, hey. And the word, the word that's used in the text means, means that to the endlessness of generations. Right. In other words, the generations have no end. Those who keep his covenant and extends grace to those who love him and observe his misfits to a thousand generations. Right. That's beautiful that the analogy that you made because it's just like with the Most High, he's giving you a, a, uh, 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 what's the, for lack of eloquence, a, 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 a way of trying to explain that if you fall out of favor, uh, there's, I have my commandments. My mitzvot are in place, just like with the wife, with her husband. Yeah. She can't do, go out and be with, you know, other guys and decide to come back and still have her man be in love yeah. with her. Yeah. Listen, listen, listen. What I am going to share with you and what I'm going to teach you over the course of this year dealing with the mitzvot and the covenant that the Most High has made with us as a people. And I, there may be some weeks that, that Sean and I don't deal with the mitzvot, but all the weeks that we do deal with the mitzvot, you have to understand and you have to come to realize something that in a marriage and in a relationship that you have with a husband and a wife and the wife is the wife is, is comes under, she comes under the protection of the man that she marries. Right. He's her covering. Right. As long as we walk in harmony with each other, husband and wife, we have a harmonious, great relationship and the husband is going to protect his wife. Yeah. I'm going to say it again. Mm -hmm. The husband is going to protect his wife. Exactly. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> yeah. The husband is going to protect his wife. Right. If Hebrew Israel is the wife of the most high, when we walk according to his mitzvot, his commandments and his covenant, and we're in a covenant relationship with him, our husband is going to protect his wife. That's right. I mean, if you read just the tomes, go ahead. I'm trying to get a point across. Yeah. The most high is going to protect his wife, Hebrew Israel. So if I'm walking, I'm, you see, I'm, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm starting to feel this. I'm really starting to feel this. If, I know beyond a reasonable doubt that in this exile, because of my obedience and my walking in favor with my Elohim, who happens to be my husband, I can truly, 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 truly say that there is no weapon formed that's formed against me that can prosper. Mm -hmm. I can truly, truly say that not only in, in 
understanding the mitzvot and the covenant relationship that I have with him, but my communication with him. See, it's it, knowing these is one thing. Mm -hmm. Walking in them is another thing. Having communication with the with the Most High, my husband, as I walk in them is another thing. Because you know what I got to do? Right. I got to walk it out. Mm -hmm. And I've got to have communication with the one who says that you're unique and that I love you. Right. It's a beautiful thing. You if you don't tell your wife she you love her, she going to come and, hey, 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 hey. She going to rattle your chain. Right. She will rattle your chain. One of two things. You haven't told me you love me, and you haven't shown me that you love me because love is an action word. That's right. And the most high, the most high shows his love and his favor and his action toward us. And it's reciprocal as we as we share with him our favor of abide, of abiding even in this exile according to his way of life he comes back and shows his love to us by giving to us something that we need in this exile and that is protection right and we get protection through our obedience to the mitzvot let me ask you this it sounds like the Most High has, with these mitzvot, giving us Hebrew Israel in exile, the picture of literally love. Yes. This is how you show your love to me. Yes. The Most High. Yes. Walking in harmony with me, having that communication that you're talking about. Yes. How do, how do I express my, 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 my gratitude, my, 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 my ability to be appreciative of your covering and all the things that you provided me, all the blessings that you provided, you provided me with a, with a land, you provided me with a culture, you provided me with gov with everything that I need to be successful. How do I show my love back to you? It's by following what you asked me to do. By obeying. By obeying. Yeah. 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 It's just a one big yeah. way of showing love. So before I get into them, you know, once again, uh, how, and to answer your question that you just asked, mm -hmm. how does a wife show her good husband that she appreciates him by being faithful? Now, you see, we talk about faithfulness within the context of a relationship mm -hmm. whereby the relationship isn't tainted by unfaithful acts within the marriage. Right, right. Well, you got to remember something. One of the reasons why we are in exile is because we, our ancestors, became unfaithful to the Most High and begin and fell into uh, uh, relationships other than the Most High, right? Which are called idols, right? That he hates emphatically, emphatically and hates it to the degree that in the prophets he refers to us as whores and prostitutes, right? Lifting up your skirt because we've been unfaithful to him. Well. What Sean and I are attempting to do to help our people to understand Hebrews in exile and those who want to join with us is that you and I can be reinstated in our relationship with the Most High by turning back to his way of life, mm -hmm. accepting his covenant, and beginning to understand the application of his mitzvot and uh, his commandments and walking and walking in them. Now, I'm going to start. I'm going to get into a couple of them here. All right. In Bereshit chapter 17, verse 10, it's the obligation for every male to be circumcised. Okay. Now, if we go over across the street 
to, I think it's first or second uh, Corinthians chapter seven. There is a dissertation mm-hmm. by Shaul. Uh, he's, and as a matter of fact, it's his commentary. Right. Because he's, he's responding to a letter that was sent to him. So it's commentary. So if it's commentary, it's not, it's not spiritually induced. It's really, it's responding to a question that's asked him. Right. And one of the questions that's asked him was about circumcision, mm-hmm. whether or not a person needed to be circumcised. Mm-hmm. The text goes on to say that if you came, if you came to, to knowing faith in Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. okay, the text, because that's what he's talking about. He says, then a man should remain as he was when he, when he came. Meaning that circumcision, being circumcised means, means nothing and being uncircumcised means nothing. Mm-hmm. That's what the text over there in Corinthians says. You all can go and read it. Right. Chapter seven. Right. I forget whether it's first or second Corinthians, but it's in chapter seven. Right. Now, here's the question on the board. The Most High says in Bereshit 17 and 10, here is my covenant. Right. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Where in any context of scriptorial text has the Most High ever broken his covenant? Never. So if he makes a covenant with us, the covenant with him is everlasting, even though we might break it, he doesn't break it. That's correct. So he says, here is my covenant, which you are to keep between me and you, along with your descendants after you. Every male among you is to be circumcised. You are to be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. This will be a sign of the covenant between me and you, generation after generation. Every male among you who is eight days old is to be circumcised, including slaves born within your household and those bought from a bought from a foreigner, not descended from you. Now, now, he is not talking about the circumcision of your heart. Oh, right. He is literally talking about in flesh, absolute circumcision, the removing of the unnecessary foreskin around the penis. Right. I'm going to call it out. I'm not going to dance with it. Right. Yeah. Now, in one of, in one of Shaul's dissertations, matter of fact, it's in Galatians. I remember it specifically. I don't remember what chapter and verse, but in Galatians, he talks about, about circumcision and being uncircumcised that's spiritualizing yeah i think that's in galatians because, 3 because listen 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 <laughs> listen listen if <laughs> if you have had the foreskin of your penis removed that which is not what not useful there's no way you can put it back Right. So there's no way to become uncircumcised. Right. The most high here in 17 is requiring, and he says it's a sign of the covenant between it. As a matter of fact, in many texts in the, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in our history book and in, in our covenant book, uh, he calls it the blood covenant. Mm-hmm. It's a covenant made by blood. He says, and this will be a sign for you generation after generation. Oh boy, I'm trying to find that, 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 that text. The slave born in your house and the person brought, bought with your money must be circumcised. Thus, my covenant will be in your flesh as an everlasting covenant. He's not talking about it, your heart. Any uncircumcised male will not who will not let himself be circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person will be cut off from his people because he has broken my covenant. Now, you have to understand the language of the text to understand what it means to be cut off. Mm -hmm. If we were in the land and you had a child that was born and eight days resided and that child was not circumcised, the parents would be held accountable for that. And if you don't believe me, go read what 
Marche's wife said to him when he failed to have his two sons circumcised. She saved his life. Right. She did. She did. She he was saved about, his life. Because he was about to get taken out. He was about ready to get taken out. Because he was so busy taking care of the issues of Israel that he forgot to have his own two boys circumcised. circumcised. Right. And his wife called him in question and told him, hey, mm -hmm. you need to stop what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Because you're getting ready to be consumed. Right. Right. And handle this matter. Right. So the Most High has made a covenant. He's asked us to do this. Now, the question becomes one. Well, hold on. There's a there's a there's another good example with that, too. And I actually want to make a correction because I did say Galatians three. It's actually in Galatians five. Yeah. It talks I, about I, the circumcision. So. But there's another good example as well when it's found in the book of Yahashua, which we talked about in the previous podcast as well, is that before they even entered the land, they had to be circumcised in order to to even go in the land and start taking it. Yeah. So, I mean, it's very important that we honor that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I want you to know. So now the question becomes becomes one. Well, what's the underlying purpose? Well, Yahweh wished to establish in the nation of Israel that he set apart to be called by his name a permanent symbol on our bodies in order to set us apart from other nations. Mm -hmm. The chosen people are to be perfected through the obligations of Torah. Thus, Man was not perfect in spiritual origin in that the Most High left as an accomplished for man the completeness of the, fo of the form of his body to man so it would be within his ability and duty to also perfect the form of his soul by refining deeds. So mm. now then, let's talk about this for mo some more for a minute. I was fortunate as a child, I'm sorry, but if I, if, if I, at my current age had to go in for circumcision, man, it'd be a little difficult. Oh man. Oh man. That, and it would be difficult. Right. And these folks, some of them had it done. With, I mean, we're using modern everyday tools, probably yeah. local anesthetics and yeah. all that. We're talking yeah. about with these folks, it was flint, flint knives. Stones. Flint snows yeah. and I, you know, but I, I'm going to say something here. Because the most, be, listen, because the most high is unique in everything that he has created. Mm -hmm. And because in the land of our origin, the most high created all of the agricultural things that we also needed. While the scripture text doesn't <laughs> tell us this, right? I have to believe that there was some aspect of natural herbs or something that was used to help uh, anesthetize the 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 situation of of this. Of this, of this, of this circumcision. Sure, I would agree totally with you. I there, I, I know of one that we probably could name right now that would be useful for that, but probably not the time and the place to bring <laughs> that one up. But yes, I agree with you. The Most High has given us everything that we need in order to uh, to carry these things out. Now, one of the other things that I want to say about this particular uh, commandment, mitzvot, is that. In today's world where we live in this exile, it's becoming harder and harder and harder for parents to get their children circumcised. Mm. I've, at least I've heard that. I've heard that. Can you give a reason why? Um, yeah, I mean, the medical industry is kind of saying like, it's not a critical, it's not a critical issue that that's that that needs to be dealt with right and um you know i i i've just heard that mm. but uh and you know um there's another aspect that i want to talk about with this okay um the oxenazis have a ritual that they go through in circumcising 
their youth. And I have been called and asked if I did it. I go, no. Right. I don't, I don't, I'm not trained in surgical removal of anything off of anybody's really? body. That's funny. You mean to ask that. Okay. Hmm. Now, if you happen to go into Oxenazi procedure mm -hmm. for doing circumcision, mm -hmm. uh, I got to tell you, it's nasty. Yeah. It's nasty. Yeah. Okay. But that's not what the most, the most high did not establish a liturgy for circumcision. He did not. He just said, do it. Right. Now, I'm going to be remedial. Okay. I'm going to be remedial. I'm giving you the disclaimer up front already. I'm going to ask you a question because probably somebody's going to ask this. I'm probably thinking this. So individuals that, and what I'm going to establish is that the intent has to be along with the action. And I'm asking a question. Do you, do you, do you agree? Yes. Because individuals are circumcised all the time. Yes. And, but they are not doing it with the intent. With, with the intent that's, that, that, that's, that the misvote provides for it. Provides for it. Okay. Right. Okay. Now, let, let me say this though. Let me say this to you. While it is, I was circumcised as a child. Okay. I had no clue. Even even up until uh, uh, 2007, mm -hmm. when we first uh, changed over from being a Christian church to being Hebraic, and I started teaching Torah, neither did I know then right. about this mitzvot. Right. So the intent, so the action of my circumcision that my mother and my father had done on me as a child was strictly a, an aspect of 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 a of a health, health issue. reason. Yeah, and many people get circumcised as a point of a health issue. But here's the point: it comes into play when the reality of this misfold comes up and it's been done. Now your question, your your question now takes a different perspective. Okay. Now I realize that the circumcision in my flesh has a deeper meaning now, according to scripture, than it did just as a matter of a health issue. Right. Right. Agreed. Agreed. That's not, likewise. I was See, the same, same now, now I realize, man, I'm 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 glad they did that. <laughs> right. Right. Likewise. Likewise. Because I'm I'm good. Right. And I don't know if you actually have it in the presentation here as far as the circumcision as well, but the most high gets detailed enough to tell you when you're supposed to be circumcised for a newborn. Yeah, I, it, it's, it, it, was, it was in the text. Okay, okay, okay. Right there in, in Bereshit chapter, chapter 10 and verse, I think it's 10 or 11. Every male among you who was eight days old is to be circumcised. Yep. So I apologize. it's, it's, it's yep. at the age of eight day, eight days old. And, you know, uh, to be honest with you, whether, whether the intent of doing this for the sake of honoring the misfote or doing it as a health issue, you really want to, you really want to do your male, your male son a favor and get this done while he is a baby and a child. Cause I mean, you got to think about something, right? Uh, father Abraham was almost, uh, a hundred years old or so when this issue came up for him and the men that were with him. Mm -hmm. So they were grown men. Right. Who had their circumcision in their flesh. And it was, it was, when we go, when we go back to the text, uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Is it Devarim, where uh, the Most High meets meets uh, Father Avraham, and he's sitting outside. He he, he always he oh, always yeah. camped by the side of the road because he was always entertaining strangers. Right. And he's sitting out in his tent in the heat of the day, and he's in a healing posture. Right. Right. Exactly. 
I it's mean, not, they all it's not fun. Up. They all wrapped up. Oh yeah, in a healing posture, mm-hmm. you know. So you want to get this done uh, as your uh, children are young and well. This mitzvot shall be done on all Hebrew males on the eighth day after birth. It applies in every location and all times. Fathers are obligated to have their sons circumcised and not a mother. So, you know, Sean, I'm, I, I, we, 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 we've set a foundation here tonight mm-hmm. to open up talking about these mitzvot. When we start out with circumcision, uh, and we've talked about the Sabbath and we've talked about the, uh, the uh, Moedim, the feast of the, the, the seven Moedims, the festivals. We've talked about the uh, dietary laws, which we're going to come back to earlier. But, you know, I, I, I kind of want you all to understand that what we're talking about is critical to our lifestyle in this exile. Mm-hmm. And that if we get back to a life of, of obeying the Father, we're his wife. He'll protect you. Right. Agreed. He'll cover you. He'll protect you from all, from from your enemy. Mm-hmm. And we've got enemies. We do. We do. You, know, you say, well, Rabbi, why didn't he protect our ancestors when they came over here in the slave trade? Well, I got to tell you something. As we close this podcast this evening. You have to remember why it is that we're in this exile. Right. And we have to remember that while our ancestors came across singing Kumbaya, help us, Yah, the Most High's hands were tied. Mm. He could not help us because he told us that he was going to disperse us to the four corners of the earth. Mm. And he told us that some of you are going to die. Right. So his hands were tied. Mm. He couldn't go back on his word to save us because we brought the action of the, of the, of the issues of our ancestors in not following the, the commandments and going into idol, I, I, idolatry and idol worship, which is the reason why we're in this exile. So he couldn't stop the process. In the middle of the stream. stream, yeah. If you go to if you go to the book of Chronicles, I know I know it's within the King. I know it's in the King James. There's a word in the Chronicles uh, writing that he says, "You have left me with no, no remedy. Remedy, right? I I I threatened. I threatened." I threaten that now you've left me with no remedy. It's kind of like a parent who keeps telling this child, you know what? Uh, if you don't stop doing that, I'm going to, if you don't stop doing that, I'm going to, if you don't stop doing that, I'm going to, and then the day comes when you don't stop because you don't realize that, it, well, she's not going to carry it out or he's not going to carry it out. Then he comes back, well, you've left me with no remedy right. because you won't stop. Right. That's the most high. Mm. We're in this exile because our forefathers would not listen to and honor him as being our husband obey his mitzvot and his covenant and his commandments, walk with him according to he, the way he wanted us. That's the reason why we're here. And this is the reason why we're, we're, we're bringing you this podcast called Hebrews in Exile to help our people to be able to raise and to be able to hear the truth of the Most High's word so that you and I can turn back to it so that your self-esteem and your spiritual wellness can be elevated Mm -hmm. so that you can realize how special and unique you are and realize that the Most High loves Hebrew Israel more than he loves any other nation on the face of this earth. And all he asks of us to do is to turn back to him and obey. Yes. Well... This has been Rabbi Robert B. Holman Jr. and Sean Appleton. And this has been Hebrews Hebrews in in Exile. Shalom. Shalom.